From the Oregon State University Extension Service, this is Pollination, a podcast that tells the stories of researchers, land managers, and concerned citizens making bold strides to improve the health of pollinators. I'm your host, Dr. Adoni Melithopoulos, Assistant Professor in Pollinator Health in the Department of Horticulture. I'm really hoping that some of my listeners had the opportunity to listen to the Environmental Protection Agency's uh, webinar series this summer uh, dedicated to assessing risk to bees from pesticides. It's a really great uh, webinar. It's really informative, and it really allows you to see how risk assessment around bees has really changed over the last uh, few years. The next installment is going to be featuring myself along with two other co-panelists, and today I'm really excited to be welcoming onto the show Katie Savinelli, who's going to who's from Syngenta Crop Protection, who's going to be on this panel along with me and Patrick Jones from uh, North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Now I've had the good fortune to work alongside Katie on um, the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign's Pesticide Task Force. Uh, Katie is um, Syngenta's U.S. stewardship team lead, and the stewardship team does things, they focus on things like environmental issues, endangered species, pesticide safety education, and pollinator and biodiversity conservation initiatives. In this uh, podcast, she's going to be talking about something that she's going to be talking about also on the webinar, namely this coalition of companies that have gotten together uh, called Growing Matters and recommendations for pesticide applicators uh, and around pollinator stewardship called Be Sure. So um, hope you enjoy this episode. Without further ado, here's Katie Savinelli this week on Pollination. Katie, I'm really excited to have you here on Pollination. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here as well, but I really appreciate it. Now, we are on an EPA webinar coming up this week, and um, the one thing, I, I got to see the practice talk, and um, I was really struck by, you had uh, you had this slide with a soybean grower, uh, Wayne Fredericks, who was talking to other growers about pollinator protection. So it raises the question, why is getting industry to convey the message around pollinator protection so important? So as, as industry, and when I talk about industry, we're the agricultural, chemical, and seed industry. And we really do believe the pollinators are important. We need them when we're growing seed crops. So that's one reason why. We also recognize that they're really part of the environment, and it's really important to protect them because we're not only protecting pollinators, but other insects, birds, et cetera, in the environment. So we want farmers to be able to farm on their fields, but then keep the rest in the environment for all of the species out there. What you'll be talking about on the EP webinar on best management practices is an initiative called Be Sure. Um, mm -hmm. what, tell us a little bit about why Be Sure was formed uh, and what problem it was trying to address. Certainly. And then just, you know, just to reiterate something about industry is that, you know, we have a lot of knowledge and best practices as well as resources for pollinators. And so we thought it really makes sense to get together. And so we got together with a number of other registrants and we are allowed to work in this space because it's non-competitive. So in 2013, a number of registrants got together and said, okay, what can we do to enable farmers to still use our products and, and the benefits of those products, but at the same time helping pollinators? So we we formed this, this group called Growing Matters Coalition. And if you're interested in the Growing Matters Coalition, which has a lot of good information, it's growingmatters.org. And then part of the Growing Matters Coalition in 2000, last year, as a matter of fact, 2019, um, we formed this Be Sure campaign. And really the whole Be Sure campaign is to get the word out to as many different people as possible about how best to use pesticides, but at the same time protecting pollinators. I guess in that slide when you had um, uh, Wayne up there, that's what precisely what he was doing to a room of soybean growers, kind of getting that conservation message out to them. As, as well as the importance of having the right tools to be able to farm. So it's that, it's that balance between tools for farming and also protecting pollinators. And Wayne is just 
for me, a really remarkable farmer because he, he gets it and they call him Mr. Monarch because he is such an avid lover of monarch butterflies and he's really he's really good. So um he's he's great to work with and he's part of Iowa Iowa Soybean Association and, and Syngenta works closely with them on a number of conservation projects. Tell us about what are what are some of the key messages that are being conveyed when um when talking to growers and applicators, you talked a little bit about this balance about, you know, maintaining products and having good pest control, but also uh, doing good pollinator stewardship. But tell us the elements on, um, you know, when when uh, what you're trying to convey and what's on the, the sort of checklist of things you're trying to get across. So the most important element, and this is for everyone that uses a pesticide. And when I talk about pesticides, I'm talking about insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. So it's it's a whole realm. But the most important element is to read the label. Please read the label because it has information about directions for use, storage, disposal, and all of the important things that um, go into a label. When we, we also talk to farmers a lot about minimizing drift or dust. So in other words, when they're uh, pl- applying uh, seeds with, treated with seed treatments, they have to you know, watch for the dust, make sure it doesn't go in the direction of where the beehives are. When they're making an application, be aware of where the beehives are. And it's, it's really important. And, and there's a lot of a really good equipment out there that's very precise that really does keep the products on the field. But it's, it's important for farmers as well as applicators because you, know, you have both aerial and um, ground applicators who are making these applications. Okay, so uh, read the label. Uh, make sure that uh, when you're applying things, you're really kind of conscious of uh, any kind of drift off field, really trying to focus on getting the product on the target rather than uh, drifting. Okay. Yeah, there a few more. Um, certainly, when you clean the equipment, be careful where you're cleaning it because you know, there's some areas that are considered to be, you know, more protected. So, you know, certainly, you know, watch where you're cleaning the equipment. And another thing that's really important, especially during either planting or applications, make sure if there are flowering plants, either in the field or around the field, to take care of them. In other words, to eliminate them. So that way the pollinators are not coming into the fields or close by when they're making an application. And, and that's actually in a lot of our labels as well is really, you know, eliminate that. So you're not creating sort of this area that's kind of dangerous. And then the other part, which is really, uh, we think is important, is really understand the crop bloom stage. So a lot of crops, let's say apples, stone fruit, that type of thing, they have a very distinctive time of blooming. And so that's when the pollinators are going to be there. And certainly with a lot of our insecticide labels, it says do not apply during bloom. So once bloom is over, it's less of a problem. But during the bloom time, certainly with insecticides, we want to be very vigilant and definitely follow the label. Yeah, and that applies not only to farmers, but also homeowners. Oh, absolutely. I guess that is some, all of those concepts apply uh, on a field as in a backyard. Mm-hmm, exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. In, in fact, just as an aside, I saw my neighbor spraying something the other day, and I said, what are you spraying? Because I thought if she's spraying a pesticide, she wasn't wearing proper clothing, but it turns out she was spraying something for the deer. But otherwise, I would have, you know, encouraged her to, you know, socks and shoes and gloves and that type of thing. So, you know, you always have to be careful when you're spraying something. Okay, fantastic. Okay, that's great. Well, all right. Mm-hmm. So um, is there any other elements that uh, um, applicators or growers need to be conscious of? Um, To me, one of the more important things is really know your beekeepers. You know, a lot of times farmers will allow beekeepers to put the the beehives on their farms. And so, you know, they kind of work together. So know the beekeepers, understand, you know, what they're facing. And then also, you know, the beekeepers need to work with the farmers. So I think that's critical as well. Okay, so we, let's sum those up. So it's really kind of reading the label, making sure that product is staying on target and where uh, there may be some uh, possibility of drift, really making sure to keep uh, the, those blooming plants down that are blooming at the same time, uh, really being careful when cleaning the equipment up, and then also having this good uh, communication, proactive communication and productive communication with your beekeeper. And if you're interested in what we're discussing, you want to see more information in addition to what you provide, um, you can go to the growingmatters.org website. And if you look under stewardship, there's a PDF file of pollinators and pesticides and the stewardship activities that we had just talked about that, you know, are a little bit more information than let's say on the label, but it's good information and it's pretty easy to read and understand. 
Oh, fantastic. We will link it in the show notes for anybody who wants to take a look. Take a look. But let's take a quick break now before we get into some of the other dimensions of uh, Be Sure. Okay, we're back. So um, I wanted to uh, just get into the how the BeSure message gets uh, communicated to applicators and growers. So we have a lot of different ways to get the BeSure me- message out there. Last year when we could travel, we were certainly going to a lot of the different trade shows, the farmer shows. I even had like a little... Um, quiz that they could take, you know, what's a bee, is a honeybee native, that type of thing. But it's really good to have some discuss. and everybody, half the people don't realize that honeybees are not native to the United States. So that was, that was fun, but it's also fun to engage farmers in just having some dialogue, understanding, you know, how they understand about pollinators, understand even about integrated pest management and how they're using integrated pest management and, and the importance of pollinators. So I think that I really like, but certainly with this year, with our limitations on traveling, we have expanded to do radio shows. We do um, digital advertising. We also do, um, advertising on either, not advertising, but Facebook, Twitter, all sorts of uh, digital platforms, just to get the word out, just to remind people. And we've done a nationwide program this year. So it's not just, last year was just corn and soybean growers in the Midwest. Now we're as far west as California and Florida. And, you know, a lot of these messages are really basic, like read the label, all of these things, but people need to be reminded and we like to remind them during either planting season or during the application season. So uh, I think right. that's really important to just constantly remind people and keep in mind a lot of um, farmers or applicators are listening to their radios. They hear some of the news stories that go on and, and, they, and they hear that and they say, oh yeah, I have to remember that. That is really good. And I think that that is key. I like I like the, the approach, both kind of like talking to growers at the trade shows so you get to understand how to craft the message and like how it resonates with them. And then really kind of that reminder. I think that reminder is always so important because a, a farmer has to remember so many things. And it's great to get a little message on the radio. It's seeding time. Uh, you know, here, remember these key messages around um, around seeding and pollinators. I think that's that's fantastic. And you know what I especially like? I love seeing the children. So you get to see the little, you know, the kids dressed up and, and they have different um, farmer outfits like John Deere and that type of thing. So I really love seeing the kids because the, the kids really sort of bring uh, the whole family element to these, some of these meetings. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and it's, but the, the one thing I did want to sort of pick up on, I was during the practice webinar, I saw like, the thing is, like a lot of us in Extension do uh, um, social media outreach, but I was astounded at the kind of reach of this campaign. Like it's yeah. it, it, it's really got to a lot of a lot of people. <laughs> so let me give you the 2019 statistics because we're still trying to gather 2020 because we're still really in the middle of it. So last year in 20 in 2019, we reached 80 million people through traditional me- media. 15 million through radio oh, and 10 million through paid wow. digital tactics. So think of that. And a lot of people say, oh, are you trying to me- measure behavior? Not necessarily because it's hard. You have to have before and after. What we're really doing is trying to create awareness. And as I said, we did it in 2019. We're continuing in 2020. And I think this program will continue as we go on because it really does have a lot of value. Well, that is a good point. I do. Th- and I, I think there's a lot of merit in that. I think, um, there are, I think that, and this is going to come out in the webinar, I think state lead agencies, uh, registrants, industry, and extension all can work together in a kind of continuum. And having that message out there um, kind of um, really pervasive allows us to do our job a lot better because uh, growers are already kind of hearing it and uh, understand it. Yeah, and we all reach some of the same people, but there's some other people that we may not be reaching. So you probably reach some people that our group doesn't reach and vice versa. So it's good to have lots of different things. And I think the other thing that's really important to me is that it's not just the company I work for, Syngenta, it's also the other companies that have the same messages. So that way we are, um, you know, not, not saying an Think we're saying the same thing rather than saying things that are, you know, antagonistic or whatever. And I think that's really important because this is something that we all believe in. Yeah, it's fantastic. Now, you, uh, you, you end the presentation uh, uh, underscoring the importance of growers and other land managers not just doing um, 
being really mindful about how they're using their pesticides uh, around high risk situations to pollinators, but also uh, about creating pollinator habitat. And I thought that was really exciting. It was a great way. It's a great way that you end the webinar. Is like there's this other growers are really good at putting things in the ground, managing things. They're the, they're they're probably the best people for establishing pollinator habitat anywhere. They know what they're doing. <laughs> um. You say that, but there does there is a certain level of expertise planting flowers that's different than let's say planting oh, okay. corn. Yeah. Because let me give you an example. I was working with a, a fellow in our a farmer in um, Mississippi, and I had sent him some seeds last year through our Operation Pollinator program. And he wrote back to me and said, oh, you know, it kind of looks not so good this year. Could you send me some more seeds? So I said, sure, certainly. And what he did was he wrote back to me and said, I went out again this year because this is year two. It looks great. <laughs> so a lot of times when you're planting these things, you have to wait for the second year to really see the effects. But he was very happy. And so we work with a lot of different farmers and especially the, you know, a lot of the farmers that we work closely with to provide them seeds to plant um, the forage and habitat. I work with a number of other groups, such as um, Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, and they also have technical expertise, mainly in the Midwest, but they're expanding and they're doing um, butterfly habitat, monarch butterfly habitat, as well as honeybee habitat. And so that's that's been fun. Who else do I work with? Oh, you didn't mention golf courses are also a really great place to grow. They are. Um, because you have all those out of play areas and we've been working with the Audubon society because they have a program called monarchs in the rough. And they're working with a lot of golf courses to plant milkweed around the country for the monarch butterfly. So that's been fun. And seeds for bees with project APSM. I could go on and on, but this is actually the most fun part of my job is, you know, <laughs> working with people, planting flowers and just, you know, seeing these wonderful effects. And then I, I was visiting another farmer in the past in Mississippi and he, same thing. First year didn't look very good, kind of embarrassed because everybody drives by his family farm. Second year, it looked it looked great. So people, you know, after they were doing family events on, on Sundays, you know, going to church, et cetera, they would stop by his place and take photographs of the family in front of the pollinator habitat because it looks so beautiful. And he was super excited. And then you have beekeepers putting their bees nearby because now they have some forage and habitat. So it's a really nice circle of the whole community. You know, and we've had, uh, I was thinking about this. It's like all three of those, you know, uh, Midwest farmers, orchardists and golf course superintendents. That's where I, that comic came. We had, we had um, Dave Phipps from golf course superintendents of uh, America, the Oregon chapter talking about some of the initiatives uh, here in Oregon and golf course superintendents really do know how, you know, especially in those roughs, they know, and Syngenta's done a great job. I know there's a number of golf courses in Oregon that have, um, um, have the C program uh, with Syngenta, uh, the operation pollinator um uh, habitat put into the roughs and it's really great because they um, they know what to do and they they do need a little bit of technical expertise I was thinking like the seed for bees program in uh, California almonds where you know it is a different crop but they do also know how to kind of like um, they're not like um, people who don't have um, they know how to use the machinery they know the timing and once they kind of work out the kinks they can really put a lot of pollinator habitat in a big uh, in um, in a large area in a short time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is remarkable. I'm, I'm really proud to be part of some of these programs and also you know, work for a company that recognizes that pollinators' biodiversity is important and they give me resources so I can do some of these things. So I have a great job. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a quick break. I know uh, the one thing I'm, uh, you know, the, the next, we have these uh, three questions we ask all our uh, all our guests, you're, you're really cheery. Well, I know you're also an entomologist, and so I'm really kind of curious. We're going to pull up the entomology side of you. <laughs> uh, well, you'll be surprised with one of my answers, but let, we'll, we'll do it. Very cool. Okay, let's take a break. Here we go. Okay, we're back. So the three questions. So first question is, is there a uh, book recommendation? 
I have two book recommendations. That's okay. Um, you got two. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the first one I was looking at is, you know, when we talk about pollinators, and I'm an entomologist by training, so I actually love all insects. So when I was thinking about this, everyone's thinking about bees and that type of things, but, you know, people also classify butterflies as pollinators. And so I was looking through my books yesterday, and I came up with the Illustrated Encyclopedia of the Butterfly World by Paul Smart. And it's a lovely book. Oh, really? It's got... Um, it's got Ooh. lots of nice photos, and they're they're by families, which I like because some butterfly books don't have them by the you know the classification. I prefer classification, being a scientist. So I think this is a really good, simple book just to really see some really beautiful um, photos of butterflies. And it's like I'm looking at it. You're holding it up. It's kind of coffee table size, and it has really large. Uh, it looks like it has really large illustrations. So it's just um, um, and it, uh, it does it. Oh yeah, look at that. Isn't that pretty? Oh yeah, you guys want this book. It's like pages of butterflies. <laughs> and and as I said, they're they're classified by families. So I went on a butterfly tour a couple of years ago and I'd say, What family is that? You know, the butterfly experts don't necessarily know the families, they know more of the species, but I'm interested in the families being an entomologist, because then it helps me understand is it like a, something like a monarch butterfly, which is an nymphalid or, or you know, a, a large butterfly like a Saturnia, that type of thing. So sorry to get too techie. <laughs> no, that's perfect. So since I was talking a little bit about forage and habitat, I am part of the Native Plant Society in North Carolina where I live, and they just came out with a book called The Southeast Native Plant Primer. Now, this is primarily for the Southeast, oh, but certainly there's book. probably a lot of native, native plant books that are available that if you're really interested in planting things around your yard and garden and, and you know, look, look to natives because natives have a lot of benefits. And, um, you know, in, in addition to the ornamentals, and they have some really pretty pictures and they talk about um, what's attractive to them. So it's bees and butterflies and that type of thing. Oh, great. So it has the description of each. It's, it's 225 uh, uh, plants, and it has some. Uh, it has a picture. It, it shows you an icon of what kind of pollinators will be attracted and a description of each one of them. That's really great. And a description of the plant, and, you know, how they grow, whether or not, you know, spring, fall, summer, you know, are they in the woods? Do they need sun? That type of thing. So I just got this book the other day. I was on a Zoom call, another Zoom call on Sunday. But this this was really a lot of fun. And in fact, they're having a call in um, September about butterflies. So that should be fun. You know, I, I find with I'm, I'm so bee focused. I uh, But what I find the thing that I get puzzled with with bee plants, it's like, you know, there's a couple great plants and you know it's good to have uh, you need the diversity obviously but it seems like the diversity of plants takes a whole different spectrum when you think about you know uh, butterfly and moth host plants like it's a yeah. quagmire well, to me it, the go-to plant always are mints mints everybody loves mints yeah. and and mints you can always tell because they have a square stem so if you um you know it has four sides to the stem so it's square yeah. and opposite leaves so mints I have mints in my yard all over the place. They love them. And the other plant, which I think you can plant in Oregon, is joe pie weed. Joe pie weed is a bee, bee magnet. And butterfly magnet. It is. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so they're flowering right now at my house, and they're just like, woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> That's what I do on my spare time. <laughs> What what better what a better thing to do? I have to I have to agree with you. I do it too. <laughs> I know. It's sort of, I, I'm so happy I became an entomologist because it's not just work, it's also outside. So I, I enjoy it completely. Well, that I guess that's the thing with a lot of pollinators. Other insects can be nocturnal and hard to uh, but with you know, at least with bees and butterflies, moths notwithstanding, they're easy to observe, and you can really, um, even as a beginner entomologist, you can really um, learn stuff fairly oh, yeah. quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and with a few exceptions, most people like butterflies. I have met students that are actually afraid of butterflies, so. I don't understand it, but most people don't even think of butterflies as being insects. So it's a really good gateway to learning more about insects. Absolutely. Okay, so our next question is, do you have a go-to tool for the kind of work that you do? I do. And this is from Purdue Extension Services, Purdue Universities in Indiana. And the name of the tool is the Complex Life of the Honeybee. 
And the reason why I like this tool so much is it goes into a lot of detail about honeybees, you know, how you raise honeybees, all of that. But then it also describes what type of studies are done to assess any potential risk from pesticides to honeybees and the, the process that the EPA follows and also the, the oh, fact. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fact that the label has the label actually represents all of the risk assessments. So, you know, we say do not apply during flowering. That's part of the risk assessment and the timing and everything. So this, if you haven't seen this, um, you have to download it because it's about 60 megabytes. But it's a really good layman's person's um, information. Oh, I love it. I recommend it to everybody, you know, not just people that are in the science area, but it's really, really good. And uh, Tom Steger, as you know, he was on the, from the EPA. He was one of the authors, you know, Syngenta has one of the people that was an author, but I think if you really want to understand what studies EPA does and how they assess risk, this is good as well as understanding, you know, the whole honeybee life cycle and, and, and some of the issues they're facing. That's fantastic. I do. I, when I talk to applicators, one of the first things we, th- we break a colony down and they're always fascinated. Like, you know, the bees get moved in, they moved out, but they don't know the moving parts of it or how it works. Mm-hmm. And they, they're always fascinated by it. But I also, the, the, those two webinars before are really great because they, you know, they really show how I think like the, the risk assessment procedure uh, process in the U S is overhauled substantially in the last few years. And there's a lot of elements to it. There's a lot of elements. It's, it's, um, I really think it's good because we're not only looking at adult bees, we're also looking at the larval bees, which I think is important. But the, the first tier is really what we call the screening tier. So in other words, it says, okay, this passes, no problem. Don't worry. This one, there's some potential problems. So we take it up to a higher tier, which is really the field effects. And to me, being a field person by training, understanding what goes on in the field is much more important than understanding what goes on the lab. The lab is sort of, you know, tells you worst case field is a reality. Okay. Well, we'll link that publication in the, uh, in the show notes. That's a great recommendation. Um, uh, you're, you're providing recommendations that nobody's provided before. So this is really, you're I wonderful. Thought, I thought I could do that. <laughs> Well, the last question is, uh, is there a pollinator species in particular that you kind of like um, uh, count as a favorite? You know, I was thinking about this yesterday, and my first inclination was to go to bees, and certainly I like some of those metallic green sweat bees because they're very colorful and dynamic and everything. But then I thought, thought, hmm, besides bees, let's talk about some other pollinators and I have a hummingbird feeder outside of my office that I get to see all day, and I also have a field camera that takes, like, little video clips. Oh, do you? Yeah. But hummingbirds are amazing, and hummingbirds are considered to be really good pollinators because as they're getting nectar from flowers, they're also spreading the pollen. So I am going to say one of my favorite pollinators is hummingbee. Hummingbirds, sorry, hummingbirds. Uh, that's excellent and you know one thing we have not done uh, and we have a good hummingbird expert who does at osu uh, we have not done a hummingbird show and you're just reminding uh, me it's time to do a hummingbird show well and you know the sad part about being in the u.s is well okay no in the west you actually have more species in the east coast we only have the ruby-throated hummingbirds so we don't really have a diversity of hummingbirds but i've been down to panama where there's like so many you don't even know half of what they are so yeah hummingbirds are really fun amazing kind of aggressive you know i see the two out there they're (laughs) fighting each other but um yeah i get to watch hummingbirds outside my office window all day long now being at home so hummingbirds so hummingbirds is my favorite pollinator right now Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for taking time uh, to talk with us, and I'm looking forward to the webinar uh, later this week. Yeah, it's really been my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for listening. The show is produced by Quinn Sin and Neil, who's a student here at OSU in the New Media Communications Program. And the show wouldn't even be possible without the support of the Oregon Legislature, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, and Western SARE. Show notes with links mentioned on each episode are available on the website, which is at pollinationpodcast.oregonstate.edu. I also love hearing from you, and there's several ways to connect with me. The first one is you can visit the website and leave an episode-specific comment. You can suggest a future guest or topic or ask a question that could be featured in a future episode. But you can do the same things on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by visiting the Oregon Bee Project. Thanks so much for listening, and see you next week.